Welcome to our magnetic and electromagnetic lecture. Yeah, this is really cool material, really foundational stuff. You guys have to fully understand electromagnetics and some magnetics as well, because they're in motors and solenoids and like pretty much tons of electronic stuff. So what we're gonna do is kind of give you a fundamental understanding of electromagnetics and magnetics. And then we're actually gonna just look at some applications, but you really need to understand this stuff like there's not a lot of work here. There's not a lot of like math and stuff that you've got to do, but it's really about kind of understanding the theory and the principles of how this all works. So just bear with me and hold on. You cannot jump into transformers without understanding magnetic induction. Yeah. Okay, let's go. This is what we're going to take a look at. We're going to take a look at the basic magnetic field and then this concept of magnetic induction, which you actually know, but you maybe don't know you know. Um, yeah, magnetic material's ability to induce and hold on to magnetic fields, that's important. Like understanding the kind of principles of how things get induced or how a, mag how a magnet will actually hold its magnetic charge, so to speak, or how easy it is or how difficult it is to charge or discharge maybe a magnet yeah so electromagnets big deal maybe that's actually important eh, maybe not so and then yeah partnering electricity and magnetic flux that's a pretty big deal too and and this whole back emf lenses law that's not actually important yeah, no it's actually really important so i'm going to do like a whole video on lenses law because it's so serious all right so let's just go here some cool applications here we'll kind of touch on those um, let's through, let's fly through these, but it's pretty cool. And yeah, that uses magnets. It's pretty cool. I don't know what that is. There's a name for that, eh? Yeah, it's pretty old, but it's still a technology that is used. Okay, let's continue all of these cool things. Cool. Did you know? Yeah, this is actually really cool. The North Pole of, uh, in, there's like a magnet in the earth and you know how that works, but check this out. Yeah, the North Pole is actually the south pole of the magnet it's pretty cool but it's true okay so uh let's continue on here and take a look at the actual the concept of flux or the field lines itself we call this stuff flux so there's a field line lots of field lines is actually called magnetic flux that's pretty cool stuff so this magnetic flux it actually likes to go from north to south and as i think you know it likes to go from this north to this south too so it leaves the north pole of a magnet and it goes to any south pole whether it's it's own south pole or another south pole it doesn't matter it just needs to go to a south pole so just remember that um and then if we put these magnets together that's what we have this repulsion and attraction of magnets which you've probably played with um yeah that's what's actually going on so this north pole likes the south pole and the opposite poles they don't like each other and this is actually what the magnetic fields look like there's fighting going on and i think we have to understand kind of this there's an interesting kind of dynamic going on here that creates forces yeah, and that's actually how we kind of move motors and there's a something called a magnetomotive force. And also in here, this magnetomotive force is kind of like this, but more specifically, the magnetomotive force is when we talk about electromagnets. Yeah, so let's continue here. Cool, so there's this concept here where like if, if something actually has the ability to manipulate a magnetic field or not, and glass doesn't, and actually soft iron does. And other materials, not just iron, actually have the ability, like nickel, have the ability to actually change or manipulate a magnetic field or be interrupted or interrupt a magnetic field or manipulate it in some way or alter it. There's that word there. So um, these are some cool terms and stuff, and we're going to get into these as we do. There's a little bit of math in here that we have to talk take a look at but there's this whole concept of magnetic flux which is pretty much this stuff here right those are the magnetic lines and that's called the flux so a bunch of magnetic lines is, is actually the flux itself um, and then we have this flux density and I think probably these are the most important things because we actually put numbers to these the permeability and the reluctance we're not actually going to put numbers on those but those are concepts that we will have to understand and yes we will do a calculation on magnetic force and it's going to be on the exam yeah okay so that's important um there we go so let's continue on here and there's this concept of magnetic flux and this is what it looks like and it's pretty cool um i've put these little guys in here for you guys because this is actually really important because you need to study this so if you see a little thing here it's pretty much that's something you absolutely need to know because i'm going to put it directly on the exam so if you don't understand magnetic flux um then you're in trouble this is the basic like we're basing everything on magnetic flux so just get to know it it's just this stuff that's what it looks like okay good so, um, and then that's the symbol for it. 
Okay, let's continue here. So the whole concept of flux density is kind of like, well, the density of these magnetic flux lines. There's actually some math to do with all of that. So we take a look at this. Actually, flux density is measured in Teslas, which is pretty cool because Tesla is like probably one of the coolest guys on the planet. Yeah. Um, so and here's the formula for it. So flux density actually makes sense is how much magnetic flux we have per area. And I think that makes sense because density is like how much stuff per space. And that's the density. So um, let's just move on. So magnetic flux is actually measured in Teslas, the big capital T. So magnetic flux density is measured in Tesla, capital T, and magnetic flux itself is measured in Weber's, very, two very cool guys. And then um, area is measured in square meters. So specifically in square meters. So if you have like a, a core where you're calculating the area in centimeters, you have to convert that to square meters. It's important that you do that. So um, yeah, and here's an example here. So read this example is pretty much just like it doubles. Think about it, you don't need a calculator, it just it doubles. Um, so let's continue here, let's fly through this. You can like kind of go back to that slide and reread it. Like, what does that say? Yeah. Um, so the magnetic flux, here's an example of a magnetic flux. Electromagnet has a diameter. Okay, so the diameter is like from here to there. 15 centimeters, I have to convert that to meters, remember. And the density, so you're giving the density in Teslas, that's actually huge. A Tesla's huge. Yeah, like those um, like MRI machines are like maybe one Tesla or two Teslas or something. So it's just huge. Um, so that was really, really big magnet. 0 0.32 Tesla's calculate the magnitude of the flux itself. So we just go through the process and we calculate it. So there's actually a milliwebers, that's fine. So also that, you know, a Weber is actually a pretty strong thing as well. Okay, here we go. So part two, oh, magnetic induction. What does that mean? Well, magnetic induction is actually pretty cool. And I think you might have done this where you actually take a... Um, Electro, many a magnet, and you just rub it along the screwdriver. It's actually pretty cool. If you don't, if you haven't done this, you should probably try it because all your screwdrivers should be magnetized because it's really cool. You just put a screw on the end of it, and then you're like, it just stays there. Oh, look at that. Oh, there's this little symbol there. So when you see these, like, stop, pause there, and you're like, oh, I have to really know this stuff because Lars is going to put it on the exam. And when you're doing the exam, you can actually just go back to this and say, well, let me jump on that on those slides. And what's that question again? Let me look at those slides with like the the light bulb and. Maybe Maybe the answer will be there. Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, magnetic induction, the process by which a material can be made into a magnet. Materials um, that are not naturally magnets can be magnetized. So this I can actually magnetize, and this is cool. They actually have natural magnets like in nature. It's pretty cool. So a uh, lodestone, which is pretty cool, and that's actually a picture of a lodestone. So, and you can see all the little kind of bits and pieces that are sticking on there. So that's all those little pieces of iron filings that are kind of stuck on there, or the pieces that are actually fallen off the rock and they're all just degrading and they're sticking on that. So it's actually pretty cool, but we can turn this screwdriver into a magnet. Now it's difficult to do it and we'll see why in a minute. So um, th this will not be a temporary magnet. That'll be like a permanent magnet, it'll stay a long time. So temporary magnets and materials easily magnetized. Okay, so temper a temporary magnet, you can easily turn into a magnet, no problem. But as soon as you like stop trying to do this, turning into a magnet with this, it's like it just goes back into like a non-magnet. Um, but then permanent magnets, so they take longer to actually turn into magnets. Again, going back to this slide here, you have to do this like hundreds of times. But once you do that, it's permanent. So it's hard to turn it into a permanent magnet, but it stays. And there's like a word for that. So there's this concept of permeability, reluctance, and retentivity. And we'll see on how well you can actually turn a material into a magnet. Okay, let's continue here. So we can actually magnetize materials. It's called magnetic induction, where we actually take something that's already actually got little tiny magnets in it. Yeah, it already has little kind of things that we call domains. And each one of them has a north and a south pole, and they're already kind of in there. And we'll see them in iron and nickel and cobalt. And what's going on here is that these things are all, uh, all crooked and all over the place and not aligned at all. But each one actually is a little magnet. So if we can actually convince them to all line up, that we're inducing a magnetic field into them. So they're all individual magnetic fields are all turning into one big magnetic field. So if it's actually really hard to do that, that magnetic field will stay for a long time. It will be permanent. But if it's really easy to do it, so those little domains, those little magnetic domains in here, they're kind of like, yeah, they're floating around going, yeah, whatever, you want me to go this way? Sure, no problem. So they're easily magnetized, but they also easily just go back. So. It's something that's not a permanent magnet. If you can magnetize it really easily, it won't stay 
magnetize. But if it takes a lot of energy and effort, like back here with this example here, it takes a lot of energy. You're going to rub and rub and rub like a hundred times or a couple hundred times, then it will be a permanent magnet. So these guys finally get aligned and they stick that way because the domains themselves are kind of a little sticky. They're kind of like, you know, okay, I'll finally go there and then they stay, right? So those are two interesting concepts. Hold on to those. So there's that term that I used a couple times was magnetic domains. And essentially these materials have these little tiny little magnets in them and then you know we're aligning them so yeah oh there's a little thing there yeah magnetic domains I maybe that's a word you should remember um and also remember this con concept of magnetizing material but well, this is a magnetic induction we'll go into that in a sec so okay so when a magnetic material is exposed to a magnetized force a magnetizing force it will remain magnetized okay so that's pretty cool it will remain magnetized and we talked about that so you understand that and there's this concept here where we're doing this so when when actually it says it will remain magnetized it means it has a high retentivity it's kind of a cool word i kind of like to say it yeah retentivity so it retains being a magnet okay cool and actually we have an example there where we're actually turning this and this actually has a high retentivity so there's actually a pretty strong magnetic field that actually burns kind of a magnetic signature onto these things and then it stays that way i have tapes from the 80s and i can still play them it's quite remarkable so part three is about how we induce a magnetic field into a material and how well it stays there and how difficult it is to induce it or how easy it is to induce it so if we take a look at this, some of these things that we actually want, we actually want to have materials. We can kind of use this to our advantage and that we want some materials to remain magnetized. Like once we magnetize them, it may take a lot of energy to do that, but it stays magnetized. And the other is that we may want magnets that just don't stay magnetized. It turns into a magnet really quickly and then turns off again. For example, this guy, this scrap picker upper magnet thing. Yeah, we want this to pick stuff up and then turn off not be a magnet anymore. So there's an electromagnet in there that turns into a magnet and induces magnetic field. All the domains that are in there, just whoosh, and they got lined up really easily and it becomes a very strong magnet. And then when we don't want to let go of all the crap, all of the scrap, then what we do is just turn off the electromagnet and all of those domains just go whoop, and they all get to crook it again and it's no longer a magnet and everything falls down. The other thing is that transformers work under the same principle in like a huge way. So when we talk about transformers, it's going to be really important that you get this concept of the induction or that we can induce a magnetic field into something. Now these guys have a really high permeability. We can permeate a magnetic field in them really easily. Those little domains in a transformer, they're like, yeah, sure, whatever. You want me to go this way? No problem, right? But then when you turn the field off, when you when you remove the magnetic field that's like making them go this way, they kind of they're kind of rogue. They go, Woo, and they just go off any way they want to go. But actually, that's a benefit to us, and we'll see how that works when we get into transformers. Um, this guy as well. That's actually the tape head that actually creates the magnetic field, and it's constantly changing, and it's actually quite strong, and it actually changes the magnetic field in the magnetic tape and then makes it permanent. So this actually has the ability to really be induced really easily and change this way or that way. So it has a very high permeability to it. Relays also have a high permeability because you have to turn them on and then off again. And we want to do that really quickly. The other thing is that transformers, we want to do that really quickly as well. So maybe this is an important slide, maybe. Okay, so um, yeah. Material permeability, it's interesting to note when we take a look at different materials, some materials have a higher permeability and some have less. Less. So ferrite has a really high permeability. You can like any kind of ferrite material, you can say, hey, like you can induce a magnetic field in it. You can align those little domains up really easily and it's just fine. And it's just, sure, I'll go that way. And then it kind of floats back pretty quickly. Um, iron also has a pretty high permeability. You can convince iron to be an electromagnet pretty easily. And then it just goes back, it changes back. But um, iron is a little bit, uh, sorry, ferrite is a little bit better. And then we actually have an air core. And these are all cores actually, and there's the symbols for the cores. So we can actually use different materials to get different magnetic properties and different speed. And obviously an air core, we can actually produce a magnetic field with this, even though it doesn't have a core. And it's the quickest thing to drop its magnetic field because there's actually no domains in this that we have to change. Let's continue. So reluctance is the reluctance of the domains in the material to actually move and get aligned. We have to actually have a really strong magnetic field and then it will finally make those domains kind of 
align. But once they do align, they stay aligned. The reluctance is actually inverse to permeability. So something with a high permeability has a low reluctance and vice versa. So as far as retentivity goes, well, retentivity is kind of like how I look at whether something has a lot of reluctance or a little bit of reluctance or has high permeability or low permeability. So essentially what's going on is that a material retentivity is inversely proportional to the permeability. So let's take a look at this. It can retain something if something is not permeable. So just stop here. Let me go over here. Actually, I like this chart a little bit better. So if the permeability, if it has high permeability, then the retentivity is low. Because if it has high permeability, those domains can be aligned really easily. But they're like I said, they're like they're rogue. And they just kind of float back wherever they want to go. Like, I don't go this way or that way. So they don't retain a magnetic field very well. So their retentivity is low. Reluctance, if it has a high reluctance, like, no, no, I don't want to do that. But you like force it into doing it, it'll actually stay that way. And its retentivity is high. So there are a bunch of examples here where you have high and low retentivity. So take a look at these. Oh, do they, are these little guys here? Yeah, maybe you should like remember those and, and just make sure that you get this concept. So I need you to understand these concepts. Okay, so let's go into electromagnets. And these actually, I think you know what electromagnets are. You run a coil around a, a core with actually those domains in them. And those domains will have, generally they'll have a pretty high permeability because you want this thing to turn into a magnet right away. So they'll have a high permeability so that those domains just flip and they go into, um, they, their magnetic field aligns and it creates a strong magnetic field. So that's how electromagnets work. But like, why is this wire going around here making an electromagnet? We'll definitely see that in action and that all about Faraday. So a magnetic force is the strength of the electromagnet. Um, oh, look at that's important. Oh, you better actually remember this formula. And actually, there's an example here. Oh, there's like a double. Oh, that's really important. Maybe this is actually a really important example. Yeah. So essentially, what's going on is that magnetic force. Now, the force itself is measured in amp turns. Now, we can see how that's actually converted to newtons, but we won't go into the math there. But it's actually pretty cool. Um, so the unit for magnetomotive force is actually amp turns. Yeah, because um, it's not, there's no compound unit for it, but it's actually the number of turns times the current. So amp turns. So that's what's going on here. So this is just a really basic example here. Um, make sure you understand that. So let's actually partner this electricity and this magnetic field together and see why that they're linked. It's pretty cool. Electromagnetism is all really about this is what's going on here. If I have current going through a wire, so if the current is actually moving, well, I guess current, the definition of current is that there's electrons moving. So if there's electrons moving through a conductor, they actually propagate this magnetic field around the conductor. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Now, we have these right-hand rules and left-hand rules. I don't need you to worry about whether the right-hand rule works or the left-hand rule. I need you to understand this concept. I need you to understand that a magnetic field is induced around a conductor with current going into it. Right? So this is like pretty high priority here. This is a concept you just need to understand that if a current is going through a conductor, there's this magnetic field around it. This actually means that if, if you can imagine any wire with current going through it, which is pretty much like all over the place, yeah, there's a magnetic field around it. So are there magnetic fields like all around you? Well, yeah, because there are wires all around you with current going through them. So it's pretty important. Now, this guy is actually showing this is from the textbook. So it's actually showing electron flow. But I, again, I don't need to know whether or not the right-hand rule or the left-hand rule works or whatever. Just understand the concept of this is how this is going. This is actually working. The direction of lines of force. Again, you can look at the right-hand rule, the left-hand rule, and remember that it's good to remember. And if you actually want to figure out how the field lines are moving, right? You can do this with your right hand, but that's with conventional current. Again, I don't need you to fully remember which way is which. I just need you to understand the concept here. So electromagnetic properties. Yeah. The, again, with an electromagnet, the same thing happens. We have this concept of reluctance, permeability and retentivity. They all exist with electromagnets as well. Here's an example of electromagnetic force. So this is actually pretty cool. So there's actually a force on this conductor. So if I had a conductor in this wire, and you'll see how this works in a minute, but just bear with me. If I have a conductor in a wire and there's current going through it, the wire will want to move. Yeah, it'll want to get out of the way of those magnetic field lines. It's pretty cool. It's actually because um, what's going on is that 
because we have this wire and that wire itself has got these magnetic field lines around it. Those magnetic field lines that are around this conductor are going around this conductor and there's kind of, there's these other magnetic field lines here and there's actually on one side there's a battle and the other side there's actually a kind of a groovy situation and we'll see that kind of a cross-sectional view. But what that does, it actually creates motor motion. Like it actually makes this wire want to move out of this magnetic field. So it's actually pretty cool. Now there's this Fleming left hand rule, which actually allows you to figure out which way the force is gonna be. But again, it's cool. You can look it up one day if you need to remember which way it is, but you, I don't think you really ever need to know that. Faraday's law, it's actually not important. Yeah, no, dude, this is pretty huge. So like I've put actually three of these here. So this is actually pretty huge. We can't move on without understanding Faraday's law. And Faraday's law pretty much has kind of two things to it. One is that if I have a changing magnetic field in the presence of a conductor, I'm actually producing what's called EMF, or electromotive force. Or actually if I have current in a conductor, then I'm actually creating a magnetic field. But more specifically, let's talk about what happens if I have a changing magnetic field in the presence of a conductor. So what's gonna happen here is that if I have more coils and in the same magnetic field that's changing, this fluctuating magnetic field, if I have twice as many coils, then my actually EMF or the voltage that's being produced, the electromotive force is twice as much. Yeah. If the coils are half, I'm gonna have half as much. Also, it has to do with the speed of the fluctuation of the magnetic field. And if that speed is low, I'm gonna have less EMF produced. So Faraday's law pretty much says, if you double the coils, you get twice as much EMF. If you double the speed, you get twice as much EMF and vice versa. Cool, that's kind of important that's going on. Now, this is pretty cool. Applications are cool, like this solenoid application. So what's going on here is that I'm producing this electromagnetic field. This guy has really high permeability and low retentivity. So um, this actually turns into a magnet because I'm actually inducing magnetic field into it. Because it turns into a magnet, it actually goes, oh, I'm gonna go this way and, psh, and it moves in like this. Now, the other thing is that if this spring is here, it's actually forcing it out. So when this is a pull solenoid, we can get also solenoids that are push solenoids. So it's pretty cool. Solenoids are amazing things and they're all over the place. Like, I think the best example of a solenoid that you can really wrap your head around is um, a door. So an electric lock on a door, yeah, you, you put your passcode on or whatever and you hear that click. That's actually a solenoid unlocking the door so you can go through. There are actually solenoids in valves as well. They're called solenoid valves. Yeah. So they change the state of the valve. And this is actually what's going on. This is how the motor action happens here. And I told you we'd see a cross-sectional area of this. So we know that there's current going through here and we know that this, this magnetic field line exists here. And then here, these guys are really groovy. And up here, there's actually kind of like a void or an eddy. And there's kind of less pressure up here. There's kind of a void in space. And what happens is there's actually a force that pushes this up. It's pretty cool. That's called motor action or motor force, motor action force. So, and then the same thing happens here when the current's going the other way. And the reason this dot exists is kind of like you're looking at an arrow coming forward. And over here, you're looking at the crosshairs going that way. And by the way, this is all electron flow. So just remember that, because you know this stuff is from the book. Again, I don't need you to know the ins and outs, which way it's going. I just need you to understand the concepts. Okay, let's continue. Um, yeah, electromagnetic induction. So electromagnetic induction is, is pretty much what's going on is that when I'm moving a wire through a magnetic field, yeah, it produces not only, and it's Faraday's law, right? And the way if it goes quickly, it'll produce more EMF. Not only does it produce EMF, electromotive force, which is voltage, but if it's connected to a load, it'll actually produce current. But specifically, I need you to kind of grasp onto this. It's a changing magnetic field in that if I move this wire through the magnetic field, it's actually, as far as the wire is concerned, it starts with no magnetic field, it starts to go through a magnetic field, and then it leaves the magnetic field. During that time, it's experiencing what it thinks is a changing magnetic field. So then we have electromagnetic induction. So we have actually this induced current, if there's voltage here, and or what we're doing is producing electromotive force. We're producing EMF, which is actually synonymous to voltage. Now, voltage in a battery is called voltage. Electrochemical is voltage. But if voltage is being produced because electromagnetism, then it's called EMF, but we still call it voltage and it's okay. So 
Relative motion, again, that just essentially means whether the wire is moving through the magnetic field or the magnetic field is moving around the wire, doesn't matter, we're still producing EMF. Induced current, well, induced voltage is EMF, and then induced current is, well, if we have a load. So if we actually do have a load, then we have current. So we can't have induced current without a closed circuit and a load. I guess if we had a closed circuit with just a wire, there's still current. So the polarity of the induced voltage, again, I don't need this is electron flow, wrap your head around this. If you want to remember which way it goes, or you're, I don't know, you're talking to some friends about this and explaining it, you can go back here and you can understand this, but you'll probably never need to use this or know this in application because it's really much more for the scientists. Um, and this is just a further example of how this is working here. Speed of voltage, again, just to say, the faster we put this through, the more EMF we have. And if there were like two wires that were going through here and they're both connected to the same thing, and they, if they were in a loop in kind of two wires through here in series, yeah. then those two wires um, would have produced twice as much EMF as well. We just voltage example. Here's some math here. So we have this thing, we have the speed of this thing. And then it's interesting. So we have the actual diameter of this guy here. And then we've got some other information like the flux density and stuff like that, the length and the magnetic flux um, and the area. So we have to calculate the flux density and we have the area here. And then we continue on. And by the way, this is in, in meters, so we know that if this was actually given in centimeters, so in meters we have to convert it to this. So be careful about that when you're converting centimeters to meters because all of this stuff is in meters. And then you go through and you calculate the Teslas and then you put the math in here and then you can figure it all out. So again, I don't need you to do the math, I just need you to understand the concepts here. Um, cool, so induced voltage, um, yeah, that's it, it has to do, actually it has to do with, this is pretty cool, the direction, I think this is another thing you have to understand, the direction of the inductor, I mean, of the conductor going through the magnetic field, if it goes this way or that way, it actually moves, it produces EMF one way or the other. So induced voltage in the direction of how the conductor is moving through the, through the field is actually really important as well. I need you to know this. So what, what's going on is that the polarity of the voltage or the EMF has to do with whether the magnetic field is moving this way or this way past the wire or whether the wire is moving this way or this way past the magnetic field. So one way produce uh, EMF in, with a polarity one way and then if you move it the other way, it produces the opposite. So that's important as well, especially when you get into transformers. So back EMF and Lenz's law. So back EMF is this really cool thing and Lenz's law is this really cool thing. Lenz's law is pretty important. It's, it's a huge thing. I'm doing like a whole video on this, but essentially it's kind of what's going on here. I just want to say that it, it actually creates kind of resistance in a circuit. And that's because when we have current going through a circuit, it produces a magnetic field. But that magnetic field in itself is a changing magnetic field in the presence of a conductor. So it actually produces EMF in opposition to the current that made the magnetic field. It's all very complicated. So just watch my Lenz's Law video, but understand that it's all about kind of resistance in the circuit. And actually in AC, where we have current going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, we actually call that reactance. And it's synonymous to the resistance that is actually produced by, by the concept of Lenz's law, which produces what we call back EMF or reverse voltage. Yeah, it's back voltage. So Lenz's law creates back EMF. And this is another example of what's going on here. Just some applications. Let's take a look at this. Yeah, dude, we wouldn't have relays without that. These wouldn't happen. So let's actually talk about the relay. And maybe if you want to pause on this, you might want to get a little bit more about the relay, but if you get the relay, just, you know, just fast forward, keep going. So I'm going to pause here for a second. So this has a spring in it, it has a normal state. This is the contact that's called normally closed. This is the contact that's the common because it's common to both of these contacts. That's the normally open. And we can see because it is a normal state, this spring is actually pulling this contact up here. So if I don't touch anything, the common, Connection one is always connected to connection two. It's the normally closed. So normally it's closed. Now, when I energize this electromagnet, it pulls the armature down and it connects over to this port three, which is the normally open, because normally that's open. When we energize it, it becomes closed and it connects here. So this is huge. This is actually how a relay works. Now, by the way, when there's the relays at Humber where we have like four different contacts. Well, what's going on is each one of those has three connections. Yeah. So they're actually this whole thing here. There are actually four of those that are moving. 
four independent ones that are moving. That's why each one has a common, a normally closed, and a normally open. So uh, the read relay is actually pretty cool. The read relay is actually works here where you actually put a magnetic field here. These two pieces of material have very high permeability. They turn into an electromagnet really quickly. And we put current through here, it produces a magnetic field. And then that magnetic field induces the, the domains in here in these two to become more of a magnetic field. And then all of a sudden these guys become north and south. They have polarity and they go boop connect together. So now they're connected. So this is really cool. Read bathers are really neat. They're actually really good. Let's take a look at advantages and disadvantages. They're really good. They can they can switch really quickly. Yeah, really quickly. And they're they're really reliable because they're less moving parts and stuff. They last for years, like decades, right? They produce less arcing, generally because we put less current through them. And the disadvantages are that they don't have the ability to put a lot of current because those those two contacts that are kind of coming together, they don't really hammer together like we can with a big strong electromagnet that just pulls the armature in like smack, right? They just kind of go whoop, like this. So we don't put a lot of current through them but they switch really, really quickly, which is a really benefit. But the other thing is that they're susceptible to shock. So if we whack them, they become open. They'll close again, but they will become open. So re is actually pretty cool. And obviously an electric motor. Oh yeah, the electromagnets we would be lost without electric motors, obviously. Um, and then, you know, we call this a moving coil loudspeaker. It's just a speaker. This is how speakers work. Speakers are actually really, really cool things. And we wouldn't have speakers without electromagnets. So I think we're good. Let's just move on to Lenz's Law of Video. So I think we're good for electromagnetism. So I think we're good for magnetism and electromagnetism. I need you to go through those slides and really study the ones with those little light bulbs on them because those questions will be pretty much on the exam and the quiz as well. So um, yeah, we're good. So that's your magnetism lecture and uh, make sure you continue watching or watch the next episode, which is about Lenz's Law because I need you to understand Lenz's Law. So that's it for magnetism and electromagnetism. I think we're good. Just make sure you go back over this PowerPoint. And so we're good for magnetism and electromagnetism. Make sure you go back through this PowerPoint again, download it from Blackboard and go over all of the different sections and really have those sections available for the ones that have all of the light bulbs on them because all of those questions will be in the exam and the quiz. So, so we're good. That's it for magnetism and electromagnetism. Make sure you download this lecture and go over it and study it and study all of this, all of the slides that have those little light bulbs on them because it's really important because it's going to be on the quiz and the exam. Now, stick with me. Watch the next video on Lenz's Law and back EMF. It's like so hugely important. Oh, yeah, and there will be quiz and exam questions on that.